2001, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry published the now famous study 329 of paroxetine. That study was the subject of fraud charges, but the public have never seen the data. So we embraced the opportunity uh, when the Riot Initiative um, called for uh, data access in order to correct misreported studies, of which uh, study 329 was a clear example. And in our reanalysis, we came to very different conclusions from those published in the original paper, um, both in terms of the efficacy of the drug and the harms that it caused. In addition, we learned quite a bit about uh, adverse event reporting and the perils and potentially misleading ways in which adverse events can be reported. And we also have something to say about data access and authorship. Um, first, in relation to efficacy, um, we didn't find particular data irregularities when we went back to the individual patient level data. Um, but what we did find uh, was a failure to follow the protocol. And when we faithfully followed the protocol as laid down in the initial research project, uh, we found that paroxetine was neither clinically nor statistically significantly superior to placebo. When we looked at adverse events, uh, data irregularities were prominent. Um, there was non-transfer of significant information from the case report forms through to the data tables. And what data was transferred to those tables was often misleadingly coded. For example, a significant suicide attempt uh, was called emotional lability. In order to establish the misreporting of um, adverse events, um, we had to carry out a, a very onerous examination of uh, individual patient data. And it was difficult both to obtain that data and to analyse it. We had to negotiate for a considerable time with GSK to get access to uh, case report forms. And once we did have access to it, it was through a remote desktop interface, which was extremely problematic to use, extremely time consuming, and uh, would I think have defeated most research teams. When it comes to examining the frequency of harms under our reanalysis, the differences between paroxetine and placebo were striking. Uh, severe adverse events were 2.6 times more frequent um, in the paroxetine group. Psychiatric adverse events were four times more frequent. Perhaps most striking was that 11 individuals in the paroxetine group engaged in suicidal or self-harming behaviour uh, compared to one in the placebo group. This slide shows the timing of suicidal and self-injurious behaviour. It also demonstrates how we found more events than the FDA and how Keller underreported even those events identified by the sponsor. An unexpected positive outcome of our analysis of this study was that we were able to characterise uh, important potential barriers to the reporting of adverse events in any trial, as you can see on this slide. For example, uh, the fact that uh, adverse events that only occur with a frequency of 5% can deny the reader from important information about the adverse events profile of a drug. So in conclusion, uh, study 329 uh, showed uh, no efficacy advantages over placebo for paroxetine and showed very disturbing pattern of harms from that drug. It also, our analysis also demonstrated the importance of data access. Now the All Trials Initiative, which initially called for data registration, has gone on to ask for clinical study reports or CSRs. If the CSR doesn't include the study protocol, we can't make valid judgments about the integrity of claims for benefit. And unless we have access to individual level data, we can't guarantee research integrity in the reporting of harms. Study 329 is not just about antidepressants in children. 
It's the paradigm of industry finance, clinical trials, reporting tainted results. It's a rallying point for how difficult it's been to get the truth about questionable drugs. We've used it to demonstrate the need to have access to a full complement of raw data. Thank you.